There we go. All right. This is nice. I will say that this is the first podcast that I have recorded sitting down. Probably in like two years. This so I'm pretty good. pumped. You look I'm pretty pumped. I'm really comfortable. I don't know why I haven't done this sooner. Uh, but I think that what we should really talk about on the podcast today is we should break down and analyze my fantasy football team and go through the potential scenarios and whether or not, you know, it looks likely that I'm going to have a good season. I've tried to talk the, uh, what in the world is going on? Ryan, Pat Ryan Patrick froze for me. He's totally frozen. I can't see him. Sounds, like like, sounds like he's doing construction. I know. I'm like... I'm here. I'm here. Hold on. <laughs> there we go. There we go. We're back. I'm like, what in the fuck was going on over there? It sounds like you were in like Santa's workshop and all the elves are in the back, like clanging on stuff. <laughs> oh man. But, uh, yeah, no, because I, I told the guy that started the league here, there has to be a punishment for last place. So that nobody just quits halfway into the fantasy season. It's like, even if you're not going to make the playoffs, you're still competing to not be last. And I told him, I think what the penalty should be, and I'm stealing this from someone in Salt Lake that I knew the penalty for his league. If you came in last place is you had to drive around with truck nuts on your car for the rest <laughs> of for the rest of the year until the next fantasy season started. He came in last place and sure as shit. He drove around with truck nuts on his car for a year. Hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I feel like that wouldn't even be that out of place down by you, though. Not... You fit right in. You probably make more friends. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, people voluntarily do that. <laughs> yeah, it's like, do you want me to take my truck nuts off as a for coming in last? <laughs> yeah. I feel like uh, for fantasy, I feel like I'm almost back to the point where I've recovered from losing so much that I'm willing to do it again. I just, I always. My big draft picks were always, like, the guys that would, like, get, like, a felony charge or, like, blow out both ACL simultaneously week one. And I'm just, like, get so mad. I Like, I, I'm mad that I lose money, but I'm more mad that I just suck so bad that I just couldn't deal with it anymore. So I was, like, I got to take a couple years off. <laughs> my, yeah, it's always a real love hate. disbanded. And uh, the only league I'm in now is uh, with my son – as a fill-in, because they needed an extra guy, which I thought was going to be a total throwaway. So now I have an auto draft team to work with against a bunch of sixteen-year-old boys. Uh. <laughs> and, and every week there, there's blockbuster trades in this league. I mean, the the top wide receiver one trade for a RB one. So it's it's going to be a really uh, on a just a great year for fantasy. Oh, what a riot! Yeah, it's always a major internal dilemma for me because I, I had a pretty solid run of whoever I take in the first round. You will have a season-ending injury. Yep. It is pretty much a foregone conclusion. And so it's like you're sitting there looking like, uh, who do I want to screw this year? Like, who who am I going to really ruin <laughs> for the next, you know, six to 12 months? And that's always a dilemma. I'm like, do I want to take Christian McCaffrey and shoot my own Panthers in the foot here? Because if he's not on the field, our offense doesn't do literally anything. Uh I but feel like he's going to get hurt anyway, available. though. That's fair. That's fair. Ah, oh, man. Well, anyways, we are going to chat today about something that we notice a lot with our own clients and then a bunch of questions and things that have come in from the social media realm. And it's this dichotomy of uh, can you burn fat and build muscle simultaneously, Right. Like I can tell you without fail, like last hundred people that I've talked to, including people we've brought on to work with us here at, at rebel, our athletes pretty much without fail. Every single person is like, Oh yeah, man, I want to burn fat and lean out. And I want to build muscle. It's like, okay, great. I love that. That's a great goal. Totally on board with that goal. But then many of them have the unrealistic expectation that they are going to be able to do both of those things at a very high level at the same time for whatever reason. Uh, maybe, maybe like it's just misinformation on the internet. People are just lying to them with like sales and marketing strategies and tactics. Um, like they see the people that go into Hollywood movies um, and they're like, man, look how like lean and cut that guy got while also like getting more muscular, blah, 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 blah. Let alone like all the pharmaceutical aid that probably went into that as well. But I just want to have like a very honest conversation about this topic 
to um, better set expectations for folks so that they can know, um, you know, is it is it very realistic for me to want to aggressively try to burn fat and lean out while at the same time building muscle? And I think the best place to start is by bucketing. And in my mind, I think you're going to fit into one of two groups here. So we have the the more newbie group, right? Like you really don't have much of a training age. You don't have much of a training history. You're probably like sub one year really into doing this thing seriously, nutrition and training at least. If you're in the in the sub one year newbie group, I do think that you can do both of these things simultaneously. That's not to say I think that's optimal, but I do think that you can do both at the same time just because anything for you is going to be progress just because it's still so new. If you're in like the one year plus category, so you have literally like any training history whatsoever, then it's going to be really, really, really difficult for you to do both of those things at the same time. And I think that you're probably going to end up just really frustrated because you're going to work really hard and not really make much progress in either direction. So let's start there first and kind of swing this around and just see, you know, if, if Kieran and Ryan, if you guys agree with that basic statement and those two broader buckets, and then maybe we can talk a little bit more about why that is the case. Uh, but let's start there, Kieran, I'll, I'll pass to you first. Uh, yeah, to your point, I think that the stimulus is so new, if you're new to training, that there's just a lot of things in flux. So that you, that's where like the simultaneous, like fat and build muscle can definitely come into play. It's just such a new stimulus, right? That a lot of things can happen. Um, I think eventually to your point, as you become, I think pretty quickly that runs out. Um, but the good news is that that's, uh, a selling point where somebody can get addicted to those results early on. I think that's a great sell potentially for somebody to, to get them into the process. And then you can kind of readjust or recalibrate the goals, uh, after that. Yeah. And I'll, I'll tag on that. Um, the, the stimulus is very powerful. I mean, anytime there's novelty and I think, I think anybody out there who's lifted any amount of time, you know, if you throw in a lateral lunge or, or a movement you haven't done in a while, there's always soreness and you can feel the difference that it makes. I think, but from a global perspective, um, there's going to be attrition in terms of how much results you're going to get from any one set, from any type of workout over time, that it just becomes harder and harder to continue to progress in one direction with a similar stimulus. And, and with resistance training, I mean, we're talking about, it could be a specific exercise. It could be the way you execute that exercise. It could be a particular rep range it becomes increasingly hard to provide enough input to get the kind of results that you want. So there's just attenuating gains. And I think at that point, it becomes really hard to, to ride two horses with one ass because, you know, adding size is going to be um, a really difficult stimulus and require a certain amount of work to build. Whereas, you know, losing it requires a different set of parameters that are actually going to allow that to take place. Yeah, I think just big picture bird's eye view, if we were to ask people to sit down and think about this critically, you don't even need a very strong physiology background for me to ask you the question. Do you think the things that you have to do to build muscle are the same things that you would have to do to lose fat? Like just conceptually, because we have to think about this, right? Like the way adaptation happens is you have some input. There is a signal. There is a stressor on the system that then causes the system to adapt, which is in what we see on the back end, right? And again, I think if you just were to ask normal folks that don't have much of a science background, most of them would probably be like, yeah, it doesn't make sense that the signal that builds muscle would be the same signal that tells the body to like shred fat and lean out. Yeah. Right? Like that is conceptually, I think for most people, hopefully that makes a lot of sense in your brain. It's like that signaling is going to be different. Mm. It, like it's different on both ends. It's different with how we structure the training for you. And it is significantly different on the nutrition front. And that's potentially the place where I think 
the biggest difference lies. Because I could probably give the same person like a, a particular training program, and then I can make you lean out or I can make you gain just purely by how I manage your nutrition on the same program. The nutrition is the biggest thing that's going to be different for for the vast majority of folks. Broadly uh -huh. speaking, if we start getting into like, I want to put on 15 pounds of muscle, blah, 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 like that gets different. But for general building muscle and for general losing weight, burning fat, leaning out, the same training program can probably accomplish both of those goals. It's how you manipulate the nutrition that's going to look drastically different on mm -hmm. the average, right? Like we're speaking in averages here. We're kind of like middle of the bell curve. We're not talking about very specific use cases. Would you guys agree with that? Yeah, I'll jump in. I mean, you know, first and foremost, like the nutrition is different, but I, you know, some people will kind of confuse this and be like, well, the difference between muscle building and fat loss is going to be, you know, five bagels a day. Like the training's the same, but the nutrition changes. So I don't think it's, it's quite that, but I think it's important for people to understand fat loss is not really, um, it's not a trainable phenomenon. Like I would train strength and get stronger. Like it's the result of calorie deficit and that's where it gets driven by nutrition. Now, from the perspective of people that we tend to work with is when people are losing fat, they want to retain as much muscle mass as possible. And I think the research is very clear. If you're doing any sort of resistance training, a large percentage of the weight that you're going to lose is going to be fat compared to muscle. Lifting weights is great for muscle building. It's also great for muscle retention. So I think some practical advice for a lot of people is to, to continue to train in the same manner. Obviously the volumes, um, the amount that you can do are going to change when you're in a calorie deficit. But I think the principles are there. And again, I just urge people to not get caught up in, oh, fat loss training. We've got to shrink all these rest periods down to 30 seconds. You know, because then with that, you get a ton of just drop off in terms of your ability to perform, your ability to actually lift some weights that are, are challenging because the metabolic demands become so high that you can't actually get any output. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I to your to your point, right? Like it's smaller changes, uh, like less is more switching the goals up after a certain amount of time where things will look very similar, you know, a couple X factors here, or there might change, but yeah, the, in terms of like, I feel like the biggest lever you could pull at that point would be the calorie deficit. Yeah. I mean that, that right out of the gate is the biggest difference here. If you're trying to lean out, lose weight, burn fat, you have to be in a calorie deficit mm -hmm. period. Like, I mean, that, it's just, it is what it is. You have to be in a calorie deficit. And shocker, if you want to build muscle and gain weight, here it comes, guys. Wait for it. You have to be in a calorie surplus. And so I can appreciate wanting both of these outcomes. One thing I will say here in, in the podcast that we did where we talked about how lean is too lean, like the cost of getting lean, because I don't think people actually appreciate the cost of getting super lean. Um, most people that want to burn fat and lean out they are doing that because they're chasing a certain uh, physique or like an aesthetic. They want to look a certain way. And LeCure, who's not with us today, made a really good point. He's like, what people don't realize is that most of the time, they will probably get to that aesthetic faster if they focus on building muscle because it'll give them that like bigger, fuller, poppier look as opposed to just continually ch like chasing this, like get as, get as lean as I possibly can. He's like, you'll probably look substantially better at like say 16, like 12, 14, 16% body fat. Cause you'll look, you will look physically bigger. Like you will have muscles that really pop for you as opposed to playing this, just like get as lean as possible game and you're sub 10% and you're like, man, I just like, don't look very good. I don't have like the muscles I'm looking for. And so again, to try to reorient folks, I can totally appreciate wanting to have a little bit of both of these, right? Like myself personally, my own training, like this is a game that I play all the time. Cause I'm very, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? I want like everything, right? It's like, I want the strength. I want the hypertrophy. I want the power. I want the endurance. Like I'm a very greedy individual when it comes to my own training. So I appreciate wanting to do all these things. And what's important to know is that you can have them, but there has to be an order and a sequence to which you do it. If you try to do all of it at the same time, like you just, you're just, you can't move it that far. Right. And so 
I think in this realm, as far as like a base recommendation goes, I think it makes way more sense for the vast majority of people to focus first on building muscle. Well, let me, let's bucket and let's bucket folks first, right? If you come in and you're like, man, I feel like I'm really overweight. I want to lose weight and lean out. Then let's focus on losing weight and leaning out. But if you're somebody who is more or less already at your weight goal, and this is a lot of folks who I talk to say, Hey, like I'm actually pretty happy with my overall body weight. I just want to do a recomposition at the body weight I'm currently at. I think that the absolute best strategy for you is to say, great, let's focus on building muscle right now. Let's give ourselves three dedicated months of building muscle. And that is going to mean that maybe you are going to put on some weight in the short term, but let's build some really high quality muscle. And then we can take you into a phase where we maybe focus more on leaning out and shredding down. And I think you'll be really happy where you are in six months because you're going to have that more, you know, muscly poppy aesthetic look and feel as opposed to trying to do both at the same time. And then you just flatline for six months and don't really get anywhere. Right. Would you guys uh, agree with that basic premise or diagnosis and order of operations? Yeah, definitely. I think, um, and some people get, uh, some people who have friends that have done it before, get a little nervous with like the recomp or, um, like trying to go into a surplus and, Oh, my buddy just got really sloppy and he put on too much weight. And so like, I don't really think that works for me. And it's like, when you say, when you're saying surplus, I think it's important for people to realize it could be like a slight surplus, right? Like it could just be like incremental gains in terms of like looking at it through like, you know, a few different training blocks or a few different blocks of like switching your, uh, your body composition goals. Right. So it's just a little bit to give you a little breathing room and to take like one step up as opposed to trying to like, you know, add like an extra, like double your caloric intake to get there in like six weeks to like, you know, try to speed it up where, you know, things like that take time. Um, so yeah, definitely that. And then just being aware that it could be kind of like what we were talking about before, like less is more in that instance. Yeah. I'll start by uh, just clarifying my biases. Um, I, anytime I'm going to do a recomp, it is of the utmost importance to me to maintain performance, whether it's strength, uh, my conditioning or speed. So that stuff for me cannot drop off. And, and for a lot of people listening, aesthetic goals can be independent of that stuff. So if you want to chase those very aggressively, you may just have the expectation that some of those things may drop off. So from that lens, I think it is much easier to start if you're at a, you know, weight stable, or even if your body fat's just a little bit too high, and it's, it's clearly not um, a priority or a health concern, I think muscle building is the way to go because you're going to put yourself in a, in a high energy flux state. You're going to be having a tremendous amount of output because building muscle requires a lot of work. You're going to be consuming more calories. Um, and it's much easier from that place to begin to diet down because now you've really cranked your metabolism for a period of time. You've built incredible performance over several months and you may not have to go as far into a deficit. Whereas I see a lot of people, they just, maybe they don't have a lot of performance or they've never really pursued the training, uh, with great intensity. And then they're trying to lose weight. They don't really have high power outputs. They're not super strong to begin with. And just their overall like output is very low, which means that you can't take in a lot of calories as well. Your deficit is going to be even lower. And it's just really hard because at that point it's like, you know, you're, you're dropping this. You're, you're, it's just much easier to diet on say 1600 calories than it is 1200. So I'd rather see people raise the roof a little bit or raise the ceiling on, on their output and make a smaller deficit. It's funny. Um, that's like one of the biggest issues sometimes with, uh, my wife who is an RD when she's working with clients. Um, and I know Aaron has come across this as well, where it's like, Hey, we actually need to like increase your output a little bit and like increase your calories. Cause I really don't have a lot of wiggle room to cut back. Right. It's like a, it's a much, you can, you have more, it's easier to progress adding uh, as opposed to always trying to take away that fat loss, like fat loss, fat loss, fat loss, like multiple phases in a row. It's just like, you just run out of room eventually. 
So creating that buffer zone, I think is huge and kind of like a mind uh, switch for a lot of people when they are starting initially, but it's setting you up for the successive blocks later on. Yeah, I think at the end of the day, the motto here that I like to try to tell people is train more, move more, do more, eat more. Everything becomes way easier when you can do that. Because I think the, the thing that's left out of the, if you want to focus on the fat loss, burn fat, lean out group, the thing that's always left out of that conversation is what's your output? But that is the number one most important question on the front end. Because the bigger your output is, like, let's, let's be honest here, let's have a very real conversation. It is much easier to have long-term success, losing weight, having the body composition that you want, if you're well-fueled eating 2,000 calories a day and still in a deficit, than if you are eating 1,200 calories in a day and you're at you know rock bottom already. And if we take you any lower, you're essentially going to be underfed and starving yourself and we don't even have basic nutrient needs met. But that's where a lot of people focus just because of the way it is. It's like everyone wants to focus on cutting calories. And it's like, yeah, you need to be in a deficit. And I posted something about this recently. I said like calorie restriction and being in a calorie deficit are not the same thing. They are in fact very different. I don't think people get their heads wrapped around that appropriately. Uh-huh. Right. I'll say it again. Calorie restriction and being in a calorie deficit are not the same thing. I'll use myself as an example. I can eat 3000 calories a day and be in a, and be in a deficit because my output's quite high. Uh-huh. Right. And so I think that when it comes to the, the burn fat, lose weight, lean out group, let's make sure we look at that output bucket first, train more, move more, do more, eat more. I think you'll be way happier. You'll get way better results and you're actually gonna have a, a good time sustaining those results long term. And you're not going to be in this yo-yo diet group that loses and brings it back and loses and brings it back because it's not sustainable because you're missing the most important variable, which is the output variable. Yeah. You're only focusing on the intake variable, mm-hmm. right? Especially in like the, these environments now, right? It's like, to your point, like, oh, you're just not going to have calories. Meanwhile, like you have a barbecue coming up or like you want to, people are coming over and like, you know, food is sent is, is centered around so many of these social events. So are you just going to stop seeing people at that point? Or, you know, that's, that's another big consideration for a lot of people. I think, I think way back to the, the heyday of T nation, John Berardi wrote a series of articles just talking about energy flux. And I, I think that's kind of what we're touching on, but the premise was, okay, if, if you're a person whose output is only 1500 calories a day, you know, for you to be isocaloric and, and be weight stable, that's 1500 calories. And it's not a lot of food. You know, if you were to up that by 50% or even 100%, so you're at, you know, 2,200 or even 3,000, there were a lot of positive changes that came with that. Like the hormone profile of these people was significantly improved. Their muscle mass was up, likely as a result of them training more. Um, Their body fat was lower. So from that perspective, there might be some small changes. You're not going to add a ton of muscle. You're not going to lose a significant amount of fat. But that high output really set the stage for a lot of positive things. And I think it touches on, you know, what you're talking about, James, is just if you don't have a lot of substrate, you don't have a lot in the tank, well, you just can't really go anywhere. And so my first encouragement to people is to always, you know, get the exercise and the output up because it's just it's going to give you so much buffer space. And I think there's a lot to be said too, just about the effects of dopamine and working out and it just really helping to kind of create these, you know, reward and feedback loops for motivation that are really critical when you're talking about behavior change when it comes to dieting. Um, My experience with a, a lot of people who try to diet in lieu of exercise or do like a diet only, it's just they just don't seem to have the the consistency, the drive long term because, you know, you're just constantly taking taking away stuff and it's, you know, and I don't want to get into the, the psychology of it, but it's just hard when it when everything's being taken away. Whereas, you know, when you're able to get a lot more in, you just don't feel deprived in pursuit of this. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, right? Because at the end of the day, if if all you focus is if your entire focus is on just the number on the scale coming down, you forget the fact that there are a lot of things taking place that you can't see. And this is what's hard as humans is that we're so focused on what we can see that a lot of times we just blindly overlook the things that we don't see. 
it's the whole Nassim Taleb idea of, you know, what are the books that you haven't read? Right. And I think that in this realm, things that fall in that category are going to be, what is your micronutrient status? What's going on with your hormones? Right. So it's like, okay, great. Yeah. The scale is maybe moving right now, but are you totally tanking this really important overall health bucket that we care about? Like what's the cost or trade off here? That's where the concept of needing to be well fueled is so important. Cause at least I know you're getting in enough of these essential nutrients. You're getting in enough micros. You have a good hormone profile now. Like women aren't losing their menstrual cycle, blah, 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 blah. Like all these other factors. That's why it's so freaking important to not lose sight of the fact that this health bucket is really important and it's not worth sacrificing that just to have the scale go down, especially when we know for a 100% fact that there's a better way to do it, that you don't have to sacrifice that. That if we just increase your output and increase your calories, but keep you in a deficit, now the scale's coming down, our health factor looks really good, you still have performance and you're getting your physique and it's the best of all worlds, right? And so let me kind of pull and zoom ourselves out here a little bit to the core question of, can you burn fat and build muscle at the same time? I think that we're really putting people into one of three buckets. So bucket number one is your body weight is higher than you would like it to be. At which point in time, it's pretty simple. Focus on burning fat and leaning out, right? Bucket number two, the people will say, my body weight is not as big as I want it. You feel like you weight not enough. Then you need to focus pretty much entirely on building muscle and bulking up, right? The one group needs a calorie deficit. The other group needs a calorie surplus. And then I think the group that we're really talking to the most here with regards to this question is our group in the middle. That's generally happy with the body weight, but they want to do a recomp thing. Like, well, I want to lean out and also kind of put on muscle at the same time. And to try to summarize what we talked about so far is like, if you're in that middle ground, the best strategy for you to take is to focus on building muscle because it's going to give you a, a fuller, poppier, more aesthetic look that you're looking for anyways, and then kind of go through a leaning out cutting phase to maybe make that give you whatever, you know, the shredded look that you're, that you're after. And we can kind of cycle you through those different phases and not just focus on trying to like, it's that idea of you try to move both things at the same time, you're just not going to get anywhere. Like you got to focus on one and then the next, and then one, that's the whole idea of block periodization, right? That's, that's how this whole thing works. Uh, that was just kind of the summary I was going to try to pick you folks here to bring it full circle. Yeah. So it just also from like a practicality standpoint, talking to like that group in the middle um, or even the other ones as well, what would you guys say from a time uh, frame or would you just kind of for each of the two um, like build muscle or fat loss phase, if you're trying to recomp or would you just kind of reassess along the way? How do you guys like to do that? Yeah, I mean, I would say that it kind of depends on the person. I think the easiest thing to do is kind of assess your progress along the way, mm -hmm. right? Because maybe we get eight weeks in and you've put on, you know, a good five pounds and like you're loving the way you look. And we just kind of like, let's just keep that thing rolling. It's hard to kind of give people a set time frame. I think it's probably going to be anywhere from about six to 12 weeks, right? Like you maybe send six to 12 weeks on building muscle and then you come down and you know, we focus on, you know, maybe six weeks of leaning out, whatever it is. I think it's, it's really difficult to give a set time recommendation because I think that will be really person by person, quite specific, just seeing what the type of progress that they're making, the tweaks and changes along the way. But I think very broadly speaking, somewhere in that like six to 12 week range for building muscle, and then probably more in the four to eight week range for lean out, burn fat. I think like those two time domains somewhere within there, I think you'll probably be pretty successful. Yeah. That kind of person I wouldn't see swinging too far either way. You know, we're not going to put them in a, a, you know, 1500 surplus or 1500 deficit. I would say they're probably a little closer to where they need. So even those periods of time where maybe you are scaling back a little bit, um, I would say the deficit is pretty small relative to somebody who's trying to aggressively pursue, um, you know, dropping body fat. And I mean, I'll share an anecdote of, you know, an experience I had with Recomp. And it was really when I started at Rebel, just to give people some timelines. I, in 10 months, I probably dropped about 6% body fat. And I think, you know, on the in body, my muscle mass did go up, but it was very, very insignificant. I think it was under five pounds. And we're probably talking about like some sarcoplasmic hypertrophy, like more fluid volume than we are actual protein content of muscles. 
And I mean, my nutrition was dialed in, but it was a very slow burn. And the amount that I was really able to swing any kind of a noticeable muscle gain was, was basically insignificant. I'm sure I could have taken a week off training and probably would have deflated and, and been fine. But um, I just, I don't think people understand, like if you're trying to do a true recomp, the, the timelines that you're looking at. So it's best to, again, to circle back, it, it, I think to invest in whatever the priority is at the time and, and allocate all the resources that you have towards pursuing that, whether it's the period of gaining muscle or you're trying to drop some body fat. Yeah, I think that's a good point to bring up, right? Is like, and also I like the time frames. And again, that's very loose, right? We're probably just going to reassess along the way. Um, but again, it just goes to show like, it's probably easier to maintain the, the adding and the building up phase, like building muscle. And it, you know, the taking away part is going to be pretty demanding physically and psychologically. So that's, probably going to be less of a time frame there, but then to put it all together, right. That's 10 months of like really dedicated work, but you know, that's, that's results that you've held on to, but it did take a little bit for that. Right. Yeah. I think the, it just comes back to, I think I'm in almost any, in almost any area in life. It's the time component. Like people just aren't patient. I, like that, like a lack of patience, I think is the number one reason that people don't get the results that they want because they're incapable of thinking if I stayed on the trajectory I'm on and I gave myself a year, where would I be? They don't, they can't play that story out in their mind. They're like, well, shit, I'm not going to be there in six weeks. Well, fuck it. I'm going to change it. But then what you don't realize is that you do that for an entire year and then you don't make any progress as opposed to if you had just stayed the course and stayed patient, you would have made so much more progress. You kind of like... You start hiking up one mountain and then you come back down and then you go hike up another mountain and then you come back down and then you go find another mountain and you come back down. It's like, you're trying to hike this one mountain and there's a hundred different trails you can take to get to the top and you switch trails every six weeks. And so by the end of the year, you're sitting there and you're not any farther up the mountain as opposed to if you had just picked one freaking trail and been on a path that gave you a little bit of freedom and flexibility to like, you know, switch over to the left a little bit, switch over to the right a little bit and just stayed consistent for a year, you'd be far, much farther up that mountain. I just, I really do think that a lack of, of patience is the number one reason that people get so stuck in these realms of training and nutrition because they're incapable and not willing to say, if I was patient and just did this every day for the next year, this is where I could be. Um, they just, they want to rush it. They want to get there faster. And because of that, they change things all the time. And so they don't ever actually get the, you know, compounding interest of return that comes from the consistency. Yeah. I think creating those small wins at the end of each training block, regardless of it's a build or fat loss, like just having those small checkpoints and small wins, right. Of like, all right, I did take, I am a little further up the trail. So let's see what happens if I go a little further and just like creating that uh, consistency, like you were saying over the long term. There always comes a phase in training, you know, somebody gets a new training program and they're, they're so excited and it's new and it's fun in the first week. And then they get to like week five or six and it's like, it's not the exact same shit, but it's like kind of the same. And it's like, that's the period where you've, you've really got to buckle down and invest yourself in the training. If it's your tempos, your back off work, your conditioning, like, I really want to know how much output can you get in zone two? And to be tactical about it. I want you to invest in every set that you're doing and get a lot out. That is really hard to do because it's at that point, it's kind of lost the, the luster of, you know, it being new and exciting. And, and it's where the real work starts to take place. And I think that you see those changes compound over time. And all of a sudden, it's like you reach this pinnacle um, whether it's just a milestone along the way or, or it's where you were originally setting out to go. And it's like, wow, like I've made so much progress. And, and it was the result of just kind of showing up every day and putting in the work or, you know, with nutrition, it's not saying no all the time, but saying no enough that you're consistent with what you set out to accomplish. And just ultimately that like when the time comes, like you show up and do the work. Yeah, I think that boredom is a majorly overlooked factor of success. 
Like boredom, like your ability is to show up and do the same thing over and over and over and over. But you kind of have to be willing to accept a little bit of boredom and repetition in your life to achieve just about anything. Uh, I think that's, a, that's another one that people just don't talk about and they very much overlook is just your ability to embrace boredom and do the same thing. Repeatedly. Hashtag be boring. Hashtag be boring. Yeah. I think about this all the time, like with the, the people who are great and everyone talks about the, the stories of Kobe and Mamba mentality and stuff. But can you imagine like how many times he showed up to the gym early? Like, God damn, like another day I got to get up and, and do the exact same thing and take the same 500 shots or whatever it is like that, that consistency and that ability to, to apply some effort to it, it, that's the amazing part. I mean, we see the highlight reels, but it's, it's yeah. the simplicity. It, it's not hard. It's not hard any one time. Anybody can do that, but to do it, you know, with a chain unbroken as long For as 15, however many years it is like, yeah, that's what it's been really nice. Actually, like the the spotlight documentaries they've been doing on athletes. You have the Tom Brady series. They did the Dare Jeter one. It's really nice being able to actually have them pull back the curtains. And I think that one of my biggest takeaways from both of those, and you have the Michael Jordan one as well on Netflix. Mm -hmm. It's the stuff that you didn't see. You see them winning championships. You see the rings. You see all the flashy stuff. But what you don't realize is the power of repetition for them, and they don't miss days. It is the same thing every single day, not for 30 days, not for 60 days, for years. Um, yeah, like that's just something that people don't realize. Yeah, and it's not the uh, the flashy stuff that gets you likes on Instagram. It's like, to your point, getting in the gym, getting up 500 shots before anybody else in the Olympic team even got to the gym, right? Like, yeah. so why, it's it's simple, but like just so methodical and with such high intent behind it. Like, isn't there a story of Kobe? I think he he missed a turnaround jumper at the end of a game. It was a it was an opportunity to win the game on the last shot, and he missed a turnaround jumper. And so the entire team goes back in the locker room. They all get changed and Kobe doesn't get changed. He just immediately goes back out in the court and he just starts getting repetitions in on the turnaround jumper. Like maintenance guy comes out. It's like, Kobe, we're shutting it down. He's like, no, you're not. Leave the lights on. Yep. It's like, I'm going to be here. I'm going to be here for a while. It's like, don't turn the lights <laughs> off. You're welcome to go home if you want. I'm going to be here for a while. And like, I, maybe it's a urban legend or something that just trickles through. But I remember reading or seeing that someplace. It was just like he, he he was there for like two hours after the game, practicing one sh practicing one shot. Oh yeah, there there's stories like that. Uh, Jay Williams, when he was still playing after his injury, showed up uh, when they were playing the Lakers, and he got there for like a twelve. It's like a twelve o'clock shoot around, but he was on the court at like eleven, and then they were ended up playing the next day. But he tried to get there early, and Kobe knew he had gotten there early the day before, so he got there even earlier. And so Jay Williams goes over to ask him, Hey, why'd you get here? Why'd you get here so early? Whatever he goes, cause I knew you were going to be here and I wanted you to know that you were not going to outwork me. So I got here early. <laughs> and so, but there's like stories like that all over the place where you're like, no, this guy's not like that. And it's like, that's just, that's why he was who he was. Right. Like yeah, yeah. people aren't successful by accident. Yeah. No, no. And I think we have to put kind of a neat like what we're talking about accomplishing here with, you know, Building yes. muscle and losing fat is not <laughs> sort of is certainly magnitude. not to that magnitude. But I yeah. think that, that the underlying principles of having that consistency, consistency. <laughs> and being able to just endure some of the mundane is absolutely critical. You know, it, it it's invaluable. I mean, you look at bodybuilders and liqueur. I mean, it's probably the same meals every day. Um, you know, you just, you have to get into some level of repetition where you can execute and, and simplify everything that you're doing so that it's really easy for you to follow through. Yeah. Yeah. We're starting to get into the realm of kind of like habits and behaviors and all of that. So let's, yeah. that's why I wrap this up here. Cause I do feel like that we, we hit on a lot of hopefully good stuff for folks that they can actually take and implement and use with regards to making decisions with your own training and nutrition. So let's go ahead and wrap this. If, if you guys have any questions, obviously on this, if we were to come over to Instagram, drop us a DM, comment on a post, whatever, get on the newsletter. Um, we'd obviously love to make some recommendations, tips, helps out any way we can, but yeah, let's wrap this. I feel like we probably did a pretty good job and we're starting to transition more into behaviors and stuff, which is an entirely different bucket. So yeah, we'll just, we'll just cut this thing here, but, uh, 
thank you for tuning in, everybody. And yeah, hope, hope everyone has a fantastic week. Thanks, guys. Thanks.